Hi Year 12, welcome to this lecture looking at um, how students' experience of schooling uh, can influence their identities, but also how the way students interact with each other within the school environment can actually influence their identities. This should have some significant crossover with um, your unit and culture and identity, um, so you may be able to apply some other theories and concepts that I haven't run through in this lecture, and you can add these onto your PowerPoint as you run through. So we're going to look at uh, the three different groups, sort of class, gender groups, and ethnic groups, and um, how their identities are, if you like, constructed within the school environment. Firstly, we're going to look at class, um, and, and particularly we're going to look at some of the ideas by uh, Bordeaux and uh, another study by Archer. And that Archer study will appear throughout actually all three of the different categories we're going to look at. So uh, Bordeaux argued that every social class has its own habitus. Uh, and a habitus, if you like, definition there for you is it's all the taken for granted ways of thinking, acting, uh, that they'd have particular tastes and preferences, and they'd have particular ideas about what's normal for people like us within their own habitus, and um, you know what sorts of um, their expectations for the future would be influenced for people like us. Um, so I've given you some examples here for middle class habitus and working class habitus. So uh, middle class, uh, generally, uh, well, they, they would argue, say, sort of in terms of their values, they value deferred gratification. So working hard to, in order to be rewarded a bit later on, for example, working hard in school in order to get a good income and a job. Um, they might value dressing um, fashionably um, or even sort of, I said, scruffy in the sense that middle class fashion can, um, you know, be almost like scruffy, second-hand chic or hipster, if you like, at the moment, and that's part of their habitus. Um, they can include sort of sports, like things like along the lines of uh, tennis, for example, uh, and part of the sort of middle-class habitus might also, you know, be valuing status from um, education as well. And in terms of their expectations in the middle class, you know, it's normal for middle-class people to go to uni, it's normal for them to travel, it's normal for them to have you know, different types of jobs, for example. Uh, whereas working class habitus um, is a slightly different sort of norm and value set and different expectations of themselves and others within their class. Um, very much um, arguably valuing immediate gratification, so they may seek immediate rewards for the work they do. Uh, and that's linked possibly to, um, you know, their financial background of their family, where maybe they have to, you know, work that week, get paid that week and pay the bills that week. Um, because of the nature of the low-paid work they might do, and that kind of value set can transfer onto their children, where they're sort of used to, you know, you work and then you get rewarded straight away, rather than putting off the reward, uh, like long-term exam success. Um, other things might include, like, thrill-seeking, you know, high jinks and pranks, um, gaining status mainly from peers, can include le different leisure activities associated with different habituses, so, you know, it might be playing football or, you know, going to the pub... Um, and, you know, in terms of fashion, it can be things like, um, like dressing in sportswear and having a sort of unique dress code. Uh, and in terms of the expectations for the future, you know, for working class people, you know, going to uni might not be the normal. It might be like, you know, going into work and, and um, settling down a bit earlier, possibly. Now, Bordeaux argued that um, the issue with these sort of two um, types of um, habitus, if you like, is that because the middle class um, sort of dominates schools, um, they dominate the government, and, you know, the middle class can determine which culture is, if you like, high culture, um, it means that in schools it's the middle class culture, it's the middle class habitus that is valued. So this is very similar to Bordeaux's idea of cultural capital, if you like, if you have cultural capital, you're more likely to be successful in schools because that's kind of what schools value, if you see what I mean. So the middle class habitus is more valuable than the working class habitus. So how do the working class sort of uh, react to this kind of schooling? Um, again, Bordeaux, there is in the right. Uh, the middle class have been socialised into the right kind of norms and values uh, and what uh, Bordeaux termed... Uh, so as a result, they gain what's called symbolic capital, okay, from the school. So symbolic capital is like your status, if you like. You get symbolic capital from your status. Um, however, the working class habitus is seen negatively, so they are denied the symbolic capital. They don't gain status from school. And Bordeaux argues this is what's known as symbolic violence against the working class. So symbolic violence is a concept that's more widely used, um, I suppose, at university-level sociology. Um, however, it's, yeah, it's a notion that... Um, it is violent to deny a group status purely because of their cultures, norms and values. So um, 
you know, the, this sort of violence against the working class leads to the reproduction of inequality. Uh, you know, because they are, look working class, because they act working class, they aren't put into top sets, they're labelled negatively. And as a result, this can lead to them not having the same opportunities, both in work um, and in education, you know, low sets, for example. And that's kind of violent um, in terms of the harm it can cause mentally, physically and financially, like forcing people to remain in poverty, that's, that's the type of violence, you know, uh, forcing them to kind of end up with jobs that have got high levels of sort of stress, injury, suicide rates, or what have you, that is a type of violence. Um, forcing people into a lifestyle that's not healthy so they die younger, that's violence. So that's what he kind of means by symbolic violence. It's not a case of them actually, you know, going out there and physically hurting them with a machete. It's uh, the structural violence of society, if you see what I mean. Um, and we're also going to be looking in detail at Louise Archer's research, who's down the bottom right-hand corner there. And she found that in order for the working class to actually succeed in schools uh, and in society, they kind of had to adopt the middle-class way of dressing and speaking and acting. And in a sense, they had to lose their working-class identity. They had to deny their background. Um, arguably, that's not fair, that's not right, and that was the only means to which they could succeed, which could place quite a lot of pressure on young people. So, um, how, what are the responses to the symbolic violence, you know, the denial of educational status uh, of the working class? Well, uh, Louise Archer uh, argued that the working class established what she called Nike identities, um, not just limited to Nike or Nike, um, but the other sports brands apply. Um, she said that the, the working class students sort of rejected the middle class culture and as a result created their own opposite identity. Um, because they, arguably they've been rejected by the mainstream culture, they therefore created uh, their opposite identity and established themselves as completely separate and different to middle class culture. Now, by developing these sort of Nike identities, uh, this gained them a sense of status from their working class peers rather than relying on the status from education. And this was quite heavily policed by their peer groups. And what she sort of means by that is if um, someone within a working class subculture, for example, or peer group, stepped outside of the Nike identity, wore something that wasn't uh, a branded jumper, for example, their peer groups would rip, uh, rip it out of them. You know, they would probably uh, call them names and might even exclude them or isolate them, which is a type of informal social control. So, yeah, the Nike identities, as I mentioned, is lots of branded sportswear. Uh, a couple of examples on the right hand there. Um, and she argued that within that, there are sort of gendered identities as well. Um, um, so within the working class, uh, a girl sort of adopted what she called a hyper-heterosexual feminine style, which um, yeah, I could only describe as sort of, sort of glamorous slash sexy Nike style, um, focusing very much on um, uh, you know, hair, makeup, nails, um, branded sportswear, but very closely fitted, um, emphasising their femininity rather than their masculinity, obviously. Now... This kind of dress style led to significant conflict with the school uniform policies, and this led to negative labelling. Um, so teachers would view the way working class students dressed, if you like, as um, going in conflict with the school rules, whereas middle class students, you know, they would be conforming to the rules because of their, their habitus and their dress sense was fine within the, the policy. Um, as a result, sort of like these sort of Nike styles, if you like, uh, they also played a part in the working class rejection of university. Um, they sort of felt that, you know, it was unrealistic for someone like them, it wasn't part of the habitus, but also it was sort of undesirable, um, you know, it was, uh, didn't fit in with their working class habitus, um, you know, so for example, going to uni on a student loan and living in a budget doesn't fit in with the brands they need to afford in order to, aff afford, in order to afford the, the sort of clothing they, they like to wear. So she said it was a bit of a, a two-way process. Like, yes, this was students reacting to them being pushed to the outskirts of, of, of schooling. They, they were responding to being marginalised by the system, which I guess is a structural cause. Um, however, she also found that many of these students were actively choosing these lifestyles um, and, and made a conscious choice and effort to dress in this particular way and establish themselves in these kind of identities. And as a result, they were self-eliminating themselves from educational success. Um, now, there is an argument that um, it's almost part of the sort of fatalism of the working class, the idea that, oh, you know, I'm never going to be successful, so what's the point in trying? Which I guess is the, the idea that, as you mentioned above, like going to university was seen as unrealistic. Um, so, yeah, thinking about the responses... Um, 
uh, when the working class actually do succeed, there is great pressure for them to fit in with the middle class habitus. So, for example, we're going to look at some research here by Ingram. Uh, now, she did research in Northern Ireland, and I know I've mentioned to you, Northern Ireland still has the 11 plus and the tripartite system. So, Ingram uh, did a, a, bit of a very detailed research on a group of working class boys from a very deprived sort of council estate neighbourhood who actually passed their 11 plus and therefore went to grammar school. Uh, and she sort of found within grammar schools there was a real sort of value around, uh, uh, sorry, there was a real set of high expectations for all students and a real sense of value for the, the middle class habitus. Whereas the secondary schools that they, they, they could have gone to if they failed, uh, they, their secondary schools generally had much lower expectations of their students. Now, these working class boys who did pass 11 plus and went on to the grammar schools were a bit like fish out of water. And uh, she found that, and there's a quote from her, the choice is between unworthiness at school for wearing certain clothes and unworthiness at home for not. So, for example, on a, on a non-uniform day in one of the grammar schools, one boy was ridiculed for wearing a tracksuit to school. Um, and I suppose this is a, the tension of um, the, the two different types of identities clashing, if you see what I mean. Um, because the, one of the things about the Nike identities that Archer ident identified was the high levels of peer policing, a lot of um, peer judgment if you stepped outside of the, the norm of the Nike identity. Um, this is because the working class culture was just not valued at all within the grammar schools, which is a symbolic violence. And um, Sarah Evans even found that working class girls who were at grammar, or sorry, were doing very well academically, were actually reluctant to apply to elite universities as it didn't seem for the likes of them. Like, it didn't fit in with their idea of what, not, what people like them went to uni. Uh, I'm sorry this has been cut out by the picture. She also finds that they were far more attached to their local area. Again, part of the working class habitus. So I mentioned to you before that the middle class habitus is very much the idea that, you know, I will travel, that's normal for people like me, I will move away from home, that's normal for people like me. But she, there's a, a, in the working class habitus, it's more like the idea that they will stay closer to home, family ties and friendship groups are far more important. So moving on to schooling and ethnic identities, again, this is still Louise Archer's research that we'll be looking, for, looking at in a bit more detail in class. Um, she argued that teachers' stereotypes of ethnic minority group students led to the construction of three different identities. Um, teachers argued that they saw, or that she found that teachers saw uh, I, the ideal pupil identity, which she argued was white, middle class, natural ability, she said there was also the pathologised pupil identity. Uh, this was like typical Asian students, deserving poor, viewed as like slogger, you know, works hard in order to, in order to achieve. This is how the teachers view these students, by the way. And the demonised pupil identity. Black or white uh, working class students who they were viewed as unintelligent, peer-led, so you know, heavily influenced by the status they came from their peers, culturally deprived and generally underachievers, you know, things like lazy, uh, suffering from a, a poor home background. That's how the teachers view these students. Um, you have to link these identities that the teachers, view, if the teachers view the students in these, in these ways, these are kind of types of labels, if you see what I mean, and arguably this can trigger the self-fulfilling prophecy. So you can make links between this and, um, if you like, Becker's um, self-fulfilling prophecy. So one thing she highlighted that she thought was quite concerning was that ethnic minority groups, all ethnic minority groups, were either the demonised groups or the pathologised pupils. So, for example, I know we've looked at hidden tigers and the achievement of Chinese and Japanese pupils, but she found that when teachers were asked about um, Chinese pupils, particularly girls, um, but boy, not boys as well, uh, they described them as a passive, quiet, hard-working mass that achieve well but in the wrong way. So in a sense, yes, these students are achieving well, um, but teachers are sort of seeing that they're almost like, uh, and they're not naturally able, they do it through hard, hard work and graft. And many teachers argued that these students actually lacked maybe some of the leadership and social skills to be ultimately successful in the real world. Now, Archer and Francis, that's Becky Francis, argued that this is kind of a negative, positive stereotype. So um, they are being positively stereotyped, but in a negative way. 
So actually, they didn't really fit, you know, Becker's notion of the ideal pupil. And that, an ideal pupil was someone who was naturally able, if you see what I mean. Whereas um, the Asian pupils weren't seen as naturally able. They were seen as people who just worked really, really, really hard in order to achieve the good grades, possibly at the expense of other social skills. So how do ethnic minority pupils respond to um, teacher labelling and negative stereotyping? And below, I've gone through three different responses. Uh, the first one is they can become really disruptive or they can become quite withdrawn. Now, Heidi Misra um, looked at this sort of withdrawn um, uh, response and she found, uh, looking at girls, by the way, in, in a comprehensive school, in the face of teacher racism, um, girls tended to avoid who they perceived as racist staff holding racist stereotypes and were selective when they asked for help with, with help for help in class, but they were also selective in the subjects they chose, so they wouldn't choose the subjects where they perceived the teachers to be you know, racist um, or judgmental or prejudiced against their particular ethnicity or other ethnicities. Now, uh, Mirza found that, yes, these girls had generally quite high self-esteem, quite high levels of self-belief in their own ability, but their sort of strategy, the withdrawal strategy, failed as it limited their opportunities uh, to succeed, they didn't ask for support when they needed it, and again, they avoided the subjects and might have furthered their sort of careers, if you see what I mean. Um, another response, as you all know, is that to reject the labels, and this is when we look at Mary Fuller's research. Again, just one, one um, study in one comprehensive school in London. However, she found that the black girls channeled their anger at being labelled into educational success, and they were quite clever about doing it um, in the sense that the girls uh, were aware of the racism in the school, were aware of their negative stereotype. However, they worked really hard on their schoolwork um, but to the casual observer, you know, they seem to be very disinterested in school. You know, you wouldn't have known to look at these girls. They were hard workers because they sort of played the game. They played up to their, um, if you like, the identity of, you know, um, educational successes for white people. So trying hard is for white people. So they didn't actively try hard. However, they did work extremely hard on their schoolwork in order to succeed. And again, they didn't succeed for the teacher. They succeeded to prove the teacher wrong. Another response is to form a subculture, and there are a range of different studies you can look at for this. I'm just going to run through Sewell with you, because we've been looking at that quite recently. Sewell argued that um, uh, there were three different responses to um, uh, negative labelling. There, Well, sorry, actually, there were four different responses, but I've only run through three here. Uh, the rebels, they're the ones that reject the goals and the rules, so really naughty, defiant. There are the conformists, which he found were the, actually the lar largest group of um, particularly black boys, um, they were keen to succeed and they avoided a subculture and they had many friends across different ethnic groups. So they didn't actually form a subculture. And there was also the innovators who were pro-education but anti-school. So did schoolwork but were fairly oppositional in class. And I suppose I'd fit Mary Fuller's girls into that, the innovators. He actually found that only a minority were actually rebels. But teachers viewed all black boys as rebels, which kind of led to negative labelling, negative, negative self-image, if you like, and arguably that can all trigger negative self-filling prophecies. Nevertheless, Sewell did argue that there was a powerful anti-school peer pressure within Afro-Caribbean boys in his research. Um, and he argued that many boys who were academic, who did um, succeed educationally or could have succeeded educationally, they found the reason, the main block to their success was the idea that if they tried hard, it was seen as selling out of their, of their culture, of their subculture. So it wasn't just, he argued, it, this um, anti-work uh, subculture didn't just come from negative teacher stereotyping. It also came from this kind of belief that, you know, to work hard was to act white, if you see what that like, I mean, within education. Going to look, move on now to schooling and gender and sexual identities, and this is quite a significant area. Um, in fact, most of the identity questions that I've seen pop up have been around gender. So, schools cannot impact gender identities in a range of ways. Okay, so for example, here are some of the ones we've already run through in class: subject choices. Uh, certain subjects carry gendered images with them, and students that take them are either seen as conforming to their gender role or deviating from their gender role if they pick a subject outside of their gender domain, if you like. So childcare, typically a female subject, would work, typically a masculine subject. 
If you get a boy doing childcare, he is very likely to be picked on by his peers. Okay, he's likely to be labelled or not called gay or a sissy. Likewise, if you get a girl taking woodwork, she's quite likely to kind of uh, be picked on by her peers or other people in the class as being, you know, butch, you know, lesbian, and those kind of negative um, name calling, ne- negative verbal abuse because they stepped outside of their gender role. So therefore, the subjects that you take either reinforce your gender identity, okay, if you pick ones for, that fit in with the, the gender roles, or they can lead to kind of abuse, verbal abuse, from peers, uh, identifying you as someone who's deviated from your gender identity. There's also the hidden curriculum, and this takes place in a range of different ways, but I've only picked a couple of ones to run through here. Uh, So feminists would say that there are a range of hidden ways schools influence pupils' formation of gender identities. Um, So one that I know we've talked about in quite quite a lot of detail is the uniform, the idea that that girls um, can and should wear skirts in in quite a lot of schools. Um, And there is the argument that by wearing skirts, that kind of leads to sort of sexualising them, um, encourages... Um, boys and men to look at them as kind of um, objects, sexual objects um, and also limits their opportunities maybe for like rough play at play time like running around, playing football and what have you uh, it kind of makes them sort of conform to the idea that you know girls maybe shouldn't be taking part in that, that kind of physical activity um, also there's things like role models, and I'm going to talk to you about role models a bit later on but around the school uh, the, sort of the, the roles that men and women play can also influence kind of the, the student's idea about what is normal for their gender identities so we've got typical gender jobs such as dinner ladies which are predominantly filled by women and caretakers if you like which are predominantly filled by men and that reinforces our ideas about what, what, what men and women do if you like So um, another issue is how teacher interactions can influence gender identities. Um, Now, teachers generally have different expectations of boys and girls, and this can reinforce what it means to be a boy or a girl. Now, when it comes to behaviour, teachers generally are more tolerant of boisterous behaviour from boys, uh, whether that's, um, you know, calling out or, you know, being a bit more physical. And they can generally allow it and just say, oh, you know, just sit down. But when girls yell out or push and shove each other or maybe even have a fight, this is dealt with much more harshly as they're acting outside their gender role. This is something we'll look at in crime and deviance. It's known as double deviance. When a girl is punished, yes, for breaking the rules, but she's also punished doubly and more harshly because she stepped outside of her gender role. It's not seen as typical for for girls' behaviour. There's also expectations. Um, Teachers tend to expect higher educational performance from girls and less from boys. And now this can trigger the positive and negative negative labelling and and the self-filling process. Um, But those expectations can uh, play a significant role in how they form their sense of self and identities. Like, I'm a girl, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to try hard. I'm a boy, um, I'm just not going to succeed because no one thinks I'm going to. And again, I just want to chat to you again about role models, but I suppose in this case, um, maybe looking a bit more at the the sort of teachers themselves. So the way male and female teachers act, behave and dress can reinforce the idea of what it means to be male and female. So for example, to use the example of this school, the increase of female head teachers can lead to girls um, sort of seeing um, uh, it normal for girls to take on leadership roles, for example, and that's how they might try to construct their identity. However... It's just worth noting that um, male teachers coming to save female teachers from poor behaving classes could reinforce the idea that women cannot cope alone. I know not all schools have um, all male behaviour teams, but uh, quite often when it comes to behaviour management, quite a lot of the time a male teacher might be responsible for it in the school. Um, And that can reinforce the idea that women can't deal with bad behaviour, they are vulnerable, they are weak, etc., uh, sorry, this slide's gone a bit funny in the formatting, but what's also significant for the formation of gender identities is the interaction between the peer groups, interactions between the peer groups themselves, and uh, particularly um, this notion of what feminists call hegemonic masculinity. So feminists argue that schools are places where hegemonic masculinity dominates at the expense of female and gay identities. Essentially, they're arguing that this hegemonic, and hegemony means dominance of one idea, uh, this controls the behaviour of both boys and girls. So what I'm going to do is talk to you very quickly about um, how it kind of limits the behaviour of girls, and then we'll look at boys as well. 
So, for example, um, the hegemonic masculinity dictates double standards of sexual morality. So it's perfectly acceptable for a guy or a boy to maybe sleep around, have a few sexual partners. Uh, and he's seen a bit of a lad as part of being a macho lad. However, if a girl does the same thing, um, she can be called a slag. But even if a girl just dresses in a particular way, so she doesn't have to have sex with anyone, but just maybe dress in uh, particularly tight clothing, short dress, skirt, sorry, maybe act in a particular way, she can be labelled a slag. And that's a form of control, okay? Saying that behaviour is not the behaviour that the hegemonic masculinity wants to see in girls. So feminists say this is a means, I should say, of maintaining the patriarchal control over female behaviour. Men dictate how girls should behave. There's also verbal abuse, which I've mentioned before. So name-calling can reinforce a sexual identity. Um, you know, so you, girls kind of walk that tightrope between called a, being called a slag, um, and I'm, I'm fairly certain you must be aware of this. Like, once a girl's kind of been labelled a slag or called a slag by um, some of the boys and girls in the school, it is a very difficult identity to overcome, and it can be really distressing. Likewise... They've also got that tightrope of being labelled frigid, you know, um, and, you know, being a, a, a frigid girl and being someone that no one sees in a sort of sexual way at all. So girls kind of, again, it's men, it's a hegemonic masculinity that control um, how they're seen, a slag or a frigid or something in between is the ideal, arguably. Um, this can also affect boys, okay, and as I said before, you've got negative labels or, or, or verbal abuse, like being called gay or lesbian or lesy, can be attached to particular behaviour. So boys just being friendly with girls, like not in a sexual way or a relationship way, just being friends with girls, can be seen as gay. So this behaviour was seen as unmasculine, and by calling boys that did that gay, it's kind of trying to force them to not behave that way, because it doesn't fit in with the idea of hegemonic masculinity. Got a picture at the top there, by the way, top right of, you know, the hegemonic masculinity, that's what all men should be and act like, if you see what I mean. There's also the male gaze, um, and this is also, this is something about male pupils and teachers um, look girls up and down and see them as sexual objects. And I would actually hasten to say that it's not just male teachers, um, it can also be female teachers, um, because teachers are always making judgments about girls' uniform and how they look, and you know, is the skirt too short, is the top too tight, are the, the trousers too tight? And so male pupils and teachers are always making judgments about what girls wear and therefore controlling them, in, controlling them in a way that boys are not subject to. And this is something I'm really critical of, I suppose, in the sense that girls are told to not wear short skirts because of boys sexualising them, because of boys looking at them and seeing them as sexual objects. So the emphasis is on the girls to change what they wear in order to prevent the boys seeing them as sexual objects. Now, many would, uh, could argue, and feminists would argue, that, hang on, isn't it the boys' responsibility to maybe stop thinking of, of girls as sexual objects and see them in terms of their personality, their character, their intelligence? A very similar debate that we look at in the beliefs module in Year 13 about the role of, you know, um, the veil and the headscarf. Should it be on, the onus be on men to control how they look at women rather than women having to cover up uh, for the sake of men looking at them in a sexual way? Uh, finally, there's also gender role polarisation, or the theory of opposites. The idea that boys and girls, when they interact with school, in school, will act in the opposite way to one another in order to reinforce what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine. Uh, so if girls put their hands up and try really hard, boys will not put their hands up and they will not try hard. Um, there's also the role of subcultures. Um, I don't want to need to go into the too much detail because we've looked at many, many studies on subcultures, particularly boys and girls subcultures. Um, boys generally are more likely to form anti-school subcultures linked to the theory of opposites I just meant to do before, as they view educational success as feminine. However, male subcultures also put pressure on each other to behave in a particular way. So, for example, the working class boys in Willis's research, Epstein and Francis, all saw working hard as being gay or effeminate. So there's pressure on boys to not work hard. Um, however, Mackingale looked at um, uh, two different types of subcultures that were formed in school, and they said, yeah, you, you've got the, the macho lads, the working-class anti-school subculture, and they called the other working-class boys who tried hard dickheads. But by contrast, you get the middle-class boys who form pro-school subcultures that Mackingale called the real Englishmen, and they attempted to project an image of effortless achievement 
um, despite many of them probably secretly at home working really, really hard in order to achieve very well in school. So boys do form both types of subcultures, and the key thing that makes a difference is the social class of the subculture. So that links back to the idea that not all boys fail, and likewise not all girls succeed. Uh, linking to why not all girls succeed, and again, I'm sorry that the formatting has gone a bit funny on this particular slide, um, I'm going to look at a bit of Louise Archer's research again and why working class girls don't do as well as their middle class counterparts. And this is what Louise Archer was really, really interested in, why, why um, working class girls failed while middle class girls did well. And she identified the following three main causes. She found that working class girls uh, gained symbolic capital, remember that's kind of like status, from conforming to their working class hyper-heterosexualized feminine identities. And that's linking back to that kind of black urban style, lots of makeup, um, lots of jewellery, etc. And I, I guess I've got a picture in the right-hand corner there of what I, I, I guess I mean by this kind of hyper-heterosexualized hyper feminine identity. She found that for working class girls, it was vital not to be seen as a tramp, uh, not to be seen as someone who's wearing, you know, Primark clothes, secondhand clothes. These girls, it was very much about looking the part. So they would spend a lot of money, significantly more money than middle class girls on hair, on makeup and jewellery. So the issue with this being excessive makeup, jewellery and sportswear puts them into conflict with the school. Um, and as a result, these girls were seen as outsiders. They were seen as, um, you know, failures. Um, and that contributed to the negative labelling, negative stereotyping, and they were viewed as doomed to failure. Archer also found that boyfriends could really um, get in the way of the educational success of the working class girls. Um, these girls were far more concerned with boyfriends than many of the middle class girls. And Archer found that these boyfriends helped increase their symbolic capital, you know, their status among their peer group, but they significantly got in the way of schoolwork. Um, she found that many of these working class girls started to value settling down with their boyfriends rather than going to uni, or they didn't like the idea of going to uni because they didn't want to be separated from their boyfriends. Um, she also found that these girls particularly were far less likely to take masculine subjects because they, they sort of believed that they, were, they that didn't conform to their feminine identity. Finally, another issue with many of the working class girls was many of them sort of um, adopted loud feminine identities um, that were seen as being um, aggressive rather than assertive. Uh, and many teachers viewed them as a behaviour problem rather than a girl who was simply trying to assert herself in a very sort of masculine classroom. And all of these things, she argued, led to many of the working class girls failing at schools because, A, they didn't want to succeed, B, they didn't value the educational success, and but also C, that the teachers didn't view them as people capable of succeeding, saw them as kind of um, uh, behaviour problems, if you like, and that led to negative labelling. So Archer argued that working class girls face a dilemma. Gain symbolic capital from their peers by conforming to their hyper-heterosexual feminine identity, or gain educational capital by rejecting their working class identity. So therefore, working class girls, just like working class boys, suffer the symbolic violence of being excluded from opportunities because their culture is deemed as worthless, it's not valued. It is worth arguing though, and this is a bit of research uh, by um, Sarah Evans, who found that not all working class girls fail, and we know that's, that's kind of generally the pattern, um, but Evans found that those that go to uni do so with the notion that they want to help out their family with their increased potential income. Um, and she found that many working class girls that went to uni also preferred local universities um, that helped with cost because they wouldn't have to pay for you know, accommodation. But also linked to the idea that many of the working class uh, students, girls and boys, like or want to stay close to home because of those family and peer bonds I mentioned to you before that are feature of the working class habitus. Just finally, I want to talk to you very quickly about the boffin identity. Um, and this is, I suppose, girls who wanted to be educationally successful, um, sociologists argued, were kind of coerced into conforming to the school's notion of the ideal female pupil. Now, this is like an asexual type of identity, uh, showing no interest in boys and boyfriends and a lack of interest in popular culture. Now, as a result of the boffin identity, this can lead to them being excluded from other girls and boys. 
Uh, and that's kind of the trade-off, if you like, for the educational capital. So they do gain, if you like, symbolic capital from the school, but there's absolutely no sort of status gain possibly from peers, um, which can be a harmful process in itself, that sense of social isolation that they may well suffer in school. Um, thanks for listening, Year 12, and uh, we'll review all of the content in class. Thank you. Bye.